I'd known Bannon since 2011. Mm-hmm. I, I just kind of talk about how I met him in the, in the preface of the book. Um, and he's such a wild and manic and interesting character that, that I, as a, as a magazine feature writer, sort of decided, well, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to write about this guy at some point. Mm-hmm. I just need to find the news peg. And I found the news peg in 2015 because Bannon came up with what I thought was a really interesting and intriguing way to hack the mainstream media. This is, mm-hmm. I think this is what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, and he, and he understood, okay, so his critique in the nineties was that conservatives got trapped in a bubble. They didn't reach mainstream voters. Uh, their, their message didn't penetrate the mainstream media. So how do you fix that? And Bannon's innovation was, well, look, it's facts and wild rumors and Vince Foster murder theories are not going to convince anybody who isn't already convinced. So what we need to do is drill down on facts, on documentable facts that are damning to Hillary Clinton. So Bannon believes in this thing, he calls it periodicity, where you don't try and tell a whole story, it's too much to swallow, you focus in on one narrow thing. Josh Marshall, I think both of our old former boss would would claim ownership of this concept. But would I, he really? I think he, uh, he he at least was early to this idea that, that news actually works in iterative fashion and, yeah. that, and, that, and that stories evolve increment by increment rather than having splash here and splash there. Well, Bannon, I mean, Bannon's thing was really just like, I don't like, think we, they get we, along. We need no, to, no, no, no. You know what? I, I think they, I tried to broker a, a breakfast between the two. Oh, really? During the, yeah, during the, it's pretty early in the campaign when think, Bannon took over and he's kind of high on his own, on his own. <laughs> You know, Supply. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and was feeling very powerful. But, but so Bannon's idea basically to hack the mainstream media was, look, let's focus on one period of Hillary Clinton's life that we think will be damning. He picked the time after she left the Senate because it really hadn't gotten the coverage that the 90s stuff had. And he focused on the Clinton Foundation mm-hmm. and he focused on all the money coming in from foreign governments, from foreign donors of, uh, you know, questionable character and intent. And they did all sorts of kind of, you know, forensic accounting and deep web scraping. Reporting. Re- real reporting. Yeah. yeah, yeah, real reporting at this uh, think tank called the Government Accountability Institute down in Tallahassee, Florida, that is legally uh, a nonprofit research en- entity, but it's paid for, it's funded by the Mercer family, the right wing billionaires mm-hmm. who pay for Breitbart News and the other stuff. And so they were able over two years to kind of come up with all this data, and it became the basis of the best selling book, Clinton Cash, which came out on the eve of. Uh, I think it came out in like May 2015, right before Clinton was announcing her candidacy. Mm-hmm. But what they did, this was Bannon's innovation, which was, which was so interesting and why I wrote about him is they didn't take this stuff and run it on Breitbart News. They purposely didn't run it in Breitbart News. And what they did is they went to the New York Times, uh, to Joe Becker and some other reporters and said, Hey, we have this reporting that we've ginned up that shows that the foundation was taking money from this, like, I can't remember what he was, like a Ukrainian, no, like a, a yeah. This is Jus- a, like a Kaz- yeah. Frank Jus- yeah, like a Kazakhstani uranium miner or whatever, uh, who was somehow in league with with Putin and the Russians and had given millions and millions and millions of dollars to the Clinton Foundation and hadn't disclosed it as as the Clintons had pr- promised they would. And so, lo and behold, even before the book comes out, suddenly one day there's a front page story. Huge spread above the fold in the New York Times, laying out this damning relationship. And there's this odd little kind of phrase about, you know, 10 paragraphs into the piece saying, you know, some of this reporting is based on the forthcoming book, Clinton Cash. And that was an example of how Bannon kind of hacked his way into the New York Times. Uh, and, and when the book came out, uh, you know, Bannon's contention was, look, I know you guys are all lefties, you investigative reporters, but I also know that you really care about stories and facts. And if we hand you a pile of facts, you will do your due diligence, chase these stories and and take them like a baton and keep reporting mm-hmm. them. And that's exactly what happened with the Clinton Cash book. Suddenly, these stories are appearing everywhere and tarnishing Clinton's image right at the moment that she's announcing her, her, her presidential campaign. So well, here's what's fascinating to me about that. And, and it ties back to the way... I feel like Bannon kind of represents a, a quantum leap in American conservatives kind of embracing anti-enlightenment, anti-democratic norms, values, whatever, is that in, in doing this, right, he's ditching the pretension that conservative media is necessary to balance out liberal media, right? His whole point is that non-conservatives can be influenced on this fact-based channel and that the conservative media's purpose is to keep the right much more propagandized, right? Exactly. And you know who had the best way of describing this was David Brock, who I interviewed back in 2015 and was really the only person I could find on the left who took seriously 
uh, the threat that Bannon posed and the threat that this Clinton Cash book posed. Because as Brock put it to me, you know, getting these negative stories into the New York Times instead of, you know, some London tabloid or the New York Post or whatever that can be ignored by the mainstream. Getting it into the New York Times is like a virus infecting a host body. If you get that in there, all of, of Clinton's potential voters are going to read it. All the other news media reporters are going to read it. And it's going to um, it's going to tarnish their impression of Hillary Clinton. And so what do you wind up with? You wind up with a, an unenthusiastic Democratic voting base as it pertains to Clinton because they see all these unseemly connections and the secret speeches and then the email thing comes out. I mean, we can talk later about whether that was exaggerated or not. But the point was um, they, 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 they tarnished Clinton's image in the eyes of these voters who then, um, through a, a stroke of dumb luck, had an alternative to choose from. Bernie Sanders, mm-hmm. who was pure and crusading mm-hmm. and kind of put her uh, ethical and moral baggage into such sharp relief. And that is exactly what Bannon was trying to do. And it's something that Clinton never really recovered from. But I guess if, if you imagine the, the reporting that made the foundation for Clinton Cash, say, or the story that ran in the New York Times, um, if you, if you imagine that transposed onto Breitbart.com, like the story would look right. different. It would be presented different. It would, it would probably be much more embellished, right? Like, and no, you, nobody, nobody in the mainstream would care, right? Cause right, well, you're, you're you, conditioned to ignore. Or it would just take a stroke of dumb luck for it to get picked up by the right, you know, like maybe a Fox News report and then, and then somebody at, at a different outlet starts looking at it and says, okay, there's something here. It's not quite as, like Ben, Ben Shapiro, you quote him in, in your book. Like, and I, you know, he, he's nobody's tribune for like liberal, (laughs) liberal norms, but he even says that Bannon for the purposes of Breitbart isn't interested. And I think he calls it like factual truth. He's he's interested about narrative narrative truth, truth, not factual truth. Right. And, and and so Bannon's confession is we keep our guys like slavering with, with propaganda, red meat. We don't even really care if our facts are correct. And then we use fact based persuasion techniques. Uh, through this cutout GAI to persuade liberals and, you know, non-conservative yeah. voters. And he even had a slogan for it. It was called, um, anchor left, pivot right. Yeah. This, this is a slogan. What that means is you anchor these anti-Clinton stories on the quote unquote left. He's referring to the mainstream mm-hmm. media, you know, the Times, the Post, Bloomberg News, what have you. And then pivot right. And so none of this stuff ever made it into Breitbart News directly. But what Breitbart would do instead was when the Times came out with a big story, Breitbart would write like five stories off the Times story saying, look, look, even the liberal New York Times right, says that Hillary is, you know, and sort of whip it up into this kind of rolling narrative of Clinton perfidy and, and evil. And that would keep the base riled up. And it would also lend, I think, credence and validity to a lot of the charges they were making because they weren't just making the charges based on their own reporting or their own, you know, conspiracy theories or contentions. They could point to the New York Times. Right. And so I like the sort of process he uses, the like the, the, the strategic process, which, you know, isn't much different than if you planted this idea of how to uh, attack Clinton in Karl Rove's head. I bet you he could execute the strategy just as well, but there's like much more clarity of, of thought about like, just what is it that the conservative media is? Is it really like the liberal media only with, with the right wing tilt or is it like a, is it a propaganda organ? Yeah. That that He's like, Karl Rove, I don't think would ever think to admit that we have this edifice like Fox and Breitbart in order to basically feed a mix of misinformation and, and hype to, to angry voters. And, that is a mobilizing tool. It, not only does Bannon have no illusions about mm-hmm. that, but he he thinks that it is useful and vital. I mean, he is. I mean, he'll he'll say this like this. This sounds like I'm insulting him. I'm saying it as if it's a pejorative. He is a propagandist. Yeah. Um. And he studies propagandist, and he understands the power that these kind of messages have. I think that's exactly what he's trying to do, and it's it's what he tried to do. It's it's what he did do. Uh, when he took over the Trump campaign. Well, and it's not just him. He surrounds himself with people who, like, consciously or not, are really, you know, very, like, in their bones, they're propagandists. Like, it, it, his patron, Robert Mercer, you point out, has a consultancy that advises foreign governments and militaries on influencing elections and public opinion using the tools of psychological warfare, right? Yeah. Like, this is not, you know, this is not, nor- like, how the, the 
the Democratic Party or even most Republican candidates think about how to persuade or or mobilize voters is not with psychological warfare, but like you take the real world as it is and you spin it as needed to, yeah. right? And there's an actual difference between the two kinds of electioneering, right? There is, and I think he recognizes it. But again, I, I still think the most important insight he had for, for, was the importance of facts as the basis of these attacks. Once those facts have been, once those facts have been published, the propaganda machine can flip on and you can you can you know but the, spin them the way you want. But the, but but the but the but the facts serve as the basis less for, you know, sure they they end up being the seeds of of propaganda, but but the purpose of them is is to get a re, you know, a real fact-based message out to people who don't read Breitbart, right? Right, to disillusion potential Clinton voters, liberals, Democrats, independents. So, I mean, I'm, I'm curious if you think that there's a way for Democrats to, to do a kind of reverse <clears throat> hack of, of conservative media. Like, the reason, uh, you know... That's it, an interesting thought. I mean, like, the, the reason... Um, I don't even want to use the term vulnerable, but the reason the New York Times you know, liberals who read the Clinton cash story and were concerned about it, et cetera, were vulnerable to this hack is because you present them with some sort of fact-based, uh, you know, research dossier and they'll, yeah. and they'll run with it. Um, well, well, they'll, they'll check it out and the, write their own. Sorry, by the way, yeah, yeah, I, I want to, I want to make clear that the, the times did everything absolutely right. Sure, sure. Like if somebody brings you facts about an important presidential candidate, you're obligated to go out and, and, and report yeah. it. And they did, and they did it well. I don't, I don't mean yeah, run okay. with it, just like post it on the, the I'm New just York covering Times my website. ass. Here. Yeah. Yeah. No, run with yeah. it as in like check it out, do due diligence yeah, and then, yeah. but, but treat it like it's a serious thing. I, I have asked, I think I asked Brian Fallon when he was on the show, like, is there a way to penetrate the filter bubble where conservatives get their information? And I, I feel like it's a much harder, uh, to mix metaphors, egg to, egg to crack, because if you tried to get this kind of damning information, you know, I've been writing about how Donald Trump is, is proving his, his disloyalty. The fact that, you know, his, his claim to, to being the super loyalist is belied by his treatment of Jeff Sessions. And if you tried to get Breitbart or something or Fox News to run a story about how, hey, maybe he's really not as loyal to his tribe as he, they would just never run it. Right. right? It's an alternate. Re I did a, it's, this isn't really in the book. It was sort of book promo, but I did a big time Sunday essay, like, I don't know, a week ago that, that essentially made this exact mm -hmm. point that, that what, what I call in the book, the conservative underworld, you know, what was previously thought to be the you know, unrespectable, you know, Breitbart news, fringe talk radio, blog, stuff like Drudge Report has really swallowed up the more traditional respectable uh right-leaning outlets like national review like fox news uh and, and now it is that underworld that kind of dominates the republican mind collectively it's voters it's it's, it's fox news viewers and you know if you watch fox i use i use lou dobbs as, as an example i mean it's like tapping into an alternate reality you know dobbs just graded Trump's first six months gave him an A plus, and you know how do you how do you find common cause? I mean, how do you how do you penetrate that bubble? I don't think you do. I, I I think I think Bannon's I think Bannon's mission would be much harder in reverse. Yeah, I mean, I I think that the problem was always uh, do, doing what Bannon did in in hacking uh, mainstream media and liberal media or whatever uh, was always going to be tougher just because that that kind of environment, Lou Dobbs. For instance, like predates Bannon in some sense, um, but I just think that what Bannon is doing in some sense is making m more mainstream conservatives feel more comfortable with this notion of exactly. uh, of propaganda being a valid way to conduct politics. But here's the thing: I'm not clear on how aware do you think those conservatives are that it's propaganda and that they're being propagandized. I, I think they mm -hmm. just accept this as you're talking the, about the, the new yeah. yeah yeah. I'm talking about more like. The like elected officials, yeah, practitioners of politics. You know, I, you know, I don't. I'm, I'm sure some of them have the self awareness to draw that distinction, but more and more, when I talk to Republican elected officials, um, on the record, but also just kind of privately and off the record, there isn't a lot of indication I get that they're in on the joke.